All right, we'll get underway then. Thank you everybody for joining us for our latest edition of the C-Band Lunch and Learn. I'm Curtis Dean, one of the co-founders of the Community Broadband Action Network, or C-Band. And this is our June edition of the C-Band Lunch and Learn, and we're really excited to uh, address a very interesting topic that could bear a lot of fruit for communities out there that are struggling to find solutions for their broadband issues. We'll uh, get to the topic here in just a second and introduce our speakers and our um, moderator. Just want to extend a big thank you to the C-Band vendor members. These are the entities that have joined C-Band as vendor members and whose dues help us uh, support all the activities we do. Now, of course, uh, in light of COVID-19, the activities have been fairly limited, but um, we do hope to be able to come back charging out of the gate with in-person meetings and uh, our annual broadband summit, which we had to cancel in March. So we hope to be able to get underway with those events just as soon as it's prudent. Uh, right now, though, we are concentrating on our lunch and learns, and I am hoping to set up our July lunch and learn very shortly. Um, uh, we are actually in the process of trying to uh, get uh, a Congresswoman Cindy Axney on our lunch and learn to talk about her involvement in a real broadband uh, bill that is uh, just now starting to emerge in Congress. So we're hoping to nail the details down on that, and we'll, of course, get that word out to everybody just as soon as we can. The topic of today's C-Band Lunch and Learn is the new market tax credits and how they can be used for financing broadband projects. Our moderator today is Shauna Silvius. She's the executive director of the Montgomery County Development Corporation in Red Oak, Iowa. And uh, I'll we'll be introducing Shauna in just a minute, and she will say more about what she's doing. Our uh, panelists and presenters are Miriam Simmons. She's a director at Ryan LLC in Dallas, Texas. And also Jonathan Claussen, who is the chief executive officer for Rural Development Partners in Forest City, Iowa. And uh, they're going to be talking about various, how this, how new market tax credits work and how they could be applicable to the projects that are out there waiting to get financed. So with that, there's our panel. I wanted to, uh, Open, you, open it up so everybody can see who they're talking to today. And uh, Shauna, I'll hand it over to you. And maybe as you get ready to introduce our panelists, you can talk a little bit about what is going on in Red Oak, Iowa and the work that you've done with Montgomery County Development Corp. Sure. Well, I, I come to Iowa about three years ago uh, into this position. And I came from Lincoln, Nebraska, where we had an initiative where Allo Communications had built out one gig fiber optics to every home and business in Lincoln. And so I saw the value, uh, especially for rural areas with entrepreneurial spirit and quality of life where people would want to enjoy living and, and creating a life. And so being so close to Omaha, we're just about 50 miles uh, southeast of Omaha Council Bluffs area. We're about two hours from Des Moines and about two hours from Kansas City. So we're really located in the great uh, area of, of our Proud state, proud state of Iowa. Um, and this is a great opportunity for us to position ourselves for technology of the future. And so uh, what was interesting about our county is fiber optics has been installed underground by um, several different vendors in our county. And the entire western, no, eastern side of my county is completely built out to every home and business. The only remaining was the 623 a rural exchange area and the city of Red Oak. And so what we've been doing for the past two and a half, three years is trying to get all of the various uh, segments on board, our investors, our cities, our county, and our provider on board and our educators to uh, understand that we have a provider right here in the part of our county, FMTC, which is Farmers Mutual Telephone Company. They have built out fiber to the entire town and rural area of Stanton and Villisca on the eastern and central side of the county. And they have built out a redundant loop around the city of Red Oak and now they're installing downtown and connecting some additional areas. Um, so the, the beginning of my job was really to help people understand the value that FMTC brings with the investment they've already made in infrastructure of, of fiber optics and to educate people on what is the difference between fiber optic delivered broadband compared to that of a coax type of, of, of distribution. So that's been challenging. Um, what we did is we tried to figure out a way to fund it without having to take it to a public vote. Uh, 
to really look at this as infrastructure because that's what it is. Um, to lay that fiber optic underground is infrastructure. And so how can we create or identify funding that will help us install that as infrastructure and help our, our communities, especially communities population size under 20,000, Red Oak is 5,400. So there's many communities our size in Southwest Iowa that are 5,400 to 6,000 that we do not have fiber optic because we are considered served because we have other providers and uh, served is 10, 10 megabytes down, one megabyte up in a neighborhood. So one house could have that. So what we've had to do is educate people about that. Um, we also know that our rural areas, many of them don't even have satellite. They don't have access to internet at all. And so we are looking at, how, we've been looking at how to build that out. Through the past couple years, we have conducted a broadband survey working with CBAN, with Todd and Curtis. Um, we did a great job of collecting some data using crowd fiber. So we saw what uh, the bandwidth was for upload download speeds of the folks in Red Oak that are receiving uh, service currently. Um, we were also able to identify what is the take rate of those that are on something that would change to something more reliable. Um, and the interest of people in wanting fiber optic delivered broadband. And so um, we've done that study, that was about a year ago. We're back to the, the drawing board on funding. And the issue again is we are considered served. So what we were able to do is uh, Farmers Mutual Telephone was able to submit a, a winning application for the first pilot round of the ReConnect uh, loan and grant program. We received, they received 6.4 million to build out the rural 623 exchange. So those folks with outside of city limits. Um, they're also going to be building a new building in our community that will have the components and they will have lines running east and west and north and south out of that building to connect to the rural areas. Um, like I said, we have a redundant loop already built in around the outside of the community. Most all of my industries have access to fiber delivered broadband. Our hospital is a major, actually they have a hub in the basement, and we have one of the best telemed hospitals in the country. We just won, won some really great awards for that. So we have the shell of what needs to happen. Uh, Tom Jensen with the U.S. Rural Development uh, Rural utility service yesterday just said, we've done all the work, we just need the funds. And the funding sources available aren't able to hit our criteria, our criteria don't meet. However, we also have a 23% poverty rate in the city of Red Oak. We have 700 rental units and we have um, a high incidence of child abuse and drug overdose. So what we want to be able to do is be able to have one gig fiber optic delivered broadband to every home and business to equalize the, the, the uh, access for all kids of all socioeconomic classes, just like every community in rural area wants to do. Um, with that in mind, we, have, we fall within the low income census tracts that Miriam is going to talk about here in a moment. Um, about half of our community could qualify for the new market tax credit. This is a program that I learned about um, from a site selector friend of mine, Jim Beatty in Omaha. He had contacted me and said that Ryan was looking to do some projects in Iowa. What did I have? And I said, well, this is to me the most important project I could finish for my rural area and community and county. So we reached out to Miriam and brought her here three times now. I think we've had you here. And um, we have talked to other entities and and I'm very actively lobbying, negotiating with all of our legislators. Cindy Axney's office has been incredible, Joni Ernst's office, as well as Senator Grassley's office, and Iowa Economic Development Authority, Iowa Area Development Group. Um, this is definitely one of those topics that we want to find a solution because we want to be the first county in the country to be one gig fiber to every home and business. And we're so close, that's our motivation. Um, I guess the key is this is a funding tool. As with all economic development projects, it takes a, a mix of things and a packaging. But this tool is very valuable, I think, for many of our rural areas and very applicable. So I'm thrilled to have Miriam. And then Jonathan is, is also with uh, 
what is considered a community development entity. I believe that's correct. Um, and so they will explain how this whole process and how this funding source works. It's, it's a lot more complex than our traditional uh, funding programs. And yet, if we can couple this with some of the new programs coming out, some of the new USDA funds, uh, the 80 million that Cindy Axneys and others from that broadband task force at the federal level are submitting, you know, maybe we can find a solution here. And, and Red Oak uh, is gonna keep fighting until we find this solution. So we appreciate you guys for hosting this and for all of you on the line that are helping us try to figure this out. Great. Um, before we get um, started with Miriam's presentation, I just wanted a little housekeeping to just let everybody know the, uh, for the attendees. If you have a question, the hit the little Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom uh, platform here. Type your question in and we will make sure we'll get to as many of those as we can before the end of the conversation uh, this afternoon. So. Um, with that, um, Shauna, take it away. And I think Miriam is going to be up first, right? Well, and the other thing I just want to mention, it's so timely with the COVID, um, because really probably the most important thing that's coming out of this is the impact that this has not only on home-based businesses or work, work remotely folks, but specifically on education, college mm -hmm. and students. And as Miriam will attest to, you know, some states and some areas are not going back to school full time. They're going to be online and that's going to continue to stress the capacity, the bandwidth capacity of the current providers that are serving areas. So while this issue is twofold, it's access to service for those underserved areas, but it's also bandwidth capacity for today and the future and it's infrastructure. So uh, as we get rolling on this conversation, I think you're going to see that this is a great tool. Uh, we've got some great partners in the state and um, some great expertise. It's just bringing everything to the table to figure these solutions out for our areas. So with Miriam, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Miriam Simmons with uh, Ryan. Uh, she comes to us from Texas. She has an extraordinary background in law and in uh, administrating the new market tax credit. So uh, she is definitely an expert in this field and I, the one person I would look to for any of the questions that you have about this program. So with Miriam, I would like to just uh, turn that over to you to explain what new market tax credits are in that program. Great, thanks Anna. All right, can you hear me? Okay, because I lost you guys, I can't hear anything. Is that better if I unmuted? No. There, okay, okay, there you go. I must somehow control that, okay. All right, do you wanna go to the I was I was muted too, sorry about that, Miriam. Okay, no problem. Do you wanna go to the, the next, next slide? slide? Okay. All right, so um, what is New Market Tax Credits? Uh, it's kind of a misnomer because um, so often I talk to my clients and and they think, well, they tell us, well, we don't need the, the um, credits, we're a nonprofit. Uh, and so when the program was established um, back in 2000, um, it was established to be um, a job creator, uh, to spur economic development in low-income communities. Uh, and yes, it was um, to provide a tax credit, which is a 39% tax credit to investors in the tax credit, but in actuality, what happens to the projects that are receiving the new market tax credit allocation is they actually get funds up front. They, they get cash because we monetize those tax credits. Um, the, the CDEs or the community development entities that Shauna was talking about earlier, um, they're the ones that actually receive that tax credit authority. They're the ones that apply with the federal government to um, get the ability to deploy those credits into qualified projects in low-income census tracts. Those community, I often get asked, well, what, you know, who can be a CDE? You know, and I tell people, well, you could be a CDE if you wanted to. Uh, almost anybody could be one, but you need to be a domestic corporation or partnership. Um, you need to have experience uh, in deploying cash um, or investments in low-income communities. You have to have the ability to identify qualified projects uh, and, and be able to identify projects that have um, community impact. 
uh, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, what do the CDEs do when they receive the, the, um, the credits from uh, the CDFI fund? What they do is they go and they take those credits, they get an investor to invest in those credits, uh, and then they make q or you know, it's, it's kind of an alphabet soup here uh, in our industry. Um, they make qualified low-income community investments um, into the business or the qualified active low-income community business, or in our world, a qualic fee. Um, and so when they make those investments, again, those investments, those cash investments come to you in the form of a low interest loan. It's interest only, uh, below market, you know, typically that um, those loans are about one to 2% interest. Uh, the projects have to be in a low income community. Uh, right now where it's based on the 2010 census, we'll be flipping that um, in the next uh, couple of rounds, it'll be based on the 2020 census. Um, but it, they've gotta be projects that, again, are gonna have high impact. Either they're going to bring in um, services like broadband, or they're going to bring in, um, they're going to be creating jobs, or it's going to be, you know, a mix of both. Um, again, the company's not going to receive the credit. So if you do want the credit, that that becomes, um, you know, another thing that you, you know, you don't get that credit. You'll actually get cash up front to reduce your investment. Uh, I tell people all the time, it's a great investment. It, it's a great incentive tool. Um, it's something that from a city's perspective, they're able to not have to take cash out of their um, out of the city's coffers, right? They're not, have to, not having to use um, tax revenue uh, in order to incentivize a business, but they're still able to incentivize that business if they have a CDE or if they've partnered with a local CDE, um, you know, similar to um, RDP. Um, but at the end of the day, it can actually help reduce the project's um, upfront investment by 15 to 20 percent. Uh, so, so what kind, what is a qualified business, right? Um, we've got a definition of what it is. Uh, it's a, a business that develops or rehabilitates commercial, uh, commercial or industrial property one that, you know, invests in community facilities or for sale housing. But interestingly enough, it can also be infrastructure. And that's where broadband comes in. Um, it can be used for asset purchases. And so, um, you know, people, you know, have often thought, oh, no, it can only be used for, you know, real estate development or for, um, manu you know, similar to, you know, manuf or manufacturing, right, for those types of assets. Uh, but we recently did a project in New Mexico where they did the broadband build out. Um, they've, they've closed on two deals now where there's been broadband built out into the more rural areas of New Mexico. There have been um, projects uh, in rural Alaska where they've been building out, I think they've got over um, $80 million in allocation, in tax credit allocation, uh, to build out the broadband infrastructure in Alaska. Uh, so while typically it, it is used for real estate and it is used for um, equipment like manufacturing equipment, we have been seeing it start to be used for things like broadband um, and because it is able to have an impact on so many different areas um, within the community, education, um, small businesses, uh, just businesses in general. Um, so it, it does have a big impact. Uh, so what are the CDEs looking for today, right? Um, you know, over the last 20 years of the program, CDFI fund, which is the um, governmental entity that administers the program, they've become pretty strict on, and Jonathan can attest to that, they've become pretty strict on, on what they're looking for. Uh, it's a very, very competitive process for the CDEs as they go and apply to get the allocation to be able to deploy into projects. And then it's very competitive from a project perspective on being able to get that allocation from those CDEs. Um, and so they're looking for strong community impacts. Um, while in the past, um, my first deal was I was with a major retailer, um, they're really not looking for Fortune 500 companies. 
not looking for the companies that that have readily able that are readily able to invest cash into their projects and this is just a way for them to increase their profits um, they're looking for job creation job creation isn't necessarily always at going to be at the company that's receiving the allocation it could be that because of the project they have it's enabling other job creation to happen um, they're looking at training opportunities and they're also looking at projects that are going into targeted areas, either in rural communities or in underserved states. Uh, so they, they take a mix of all of those impacts uh, and, and tell, in order to tell the story as to why this is a good project for a new market tax credit allocation. So just to give you an example, um, <laughs> up until uh, today um, we had just this 85 cent discount rate because the, the credits the, the investors in the credits do purchase those credits at a discounted rate uh, because they take those credits over um, seven years uh, we were using 85 cents as the top um, is what investors were using but with everything that's been happening with COVID-19 there's been a, a, a major shift in what the investors are paying for the credit so um, we did add in this, the, what we're seeing today is the, the discount rate on the credits, just to, to give you more of, of what today's benefit really would be. Um, you know, I, I believe that we'll get back up to the 85 cents um, on the dollar discount rate. I don't think it'll take that long because I think, um, I, I don't think that the hit um, from COVID-19 is going to be similar um, crash in, in 2007 2008 but um, you know just to give you an example of what the benefit could be and, and we'll use today's um, discount rate a 10 million dollar project um, which would receive a 10 million dollar allocation is going to generate 3.9 million in tax credits because it is a 39 percent tax credit um, that means that at a 70 cent um, discount rate, the new market tax credit uh, equity is going to be about 2.7, uh, which means that um, after closing costs um, and, and fees that happen, um, the company's uh, $10 million investment is reduced to 7.9. So on the day of closing, their benefit is about $2 million. Uh, the interest payments that the loan that they're going to get that um, two million dollar loan that they're going to get is going to be the interest is going to be roughly about five hundred thousand uh, dollars give or take depending on how the deal is structured and those that's going to be paid over seven years sometimes uh, they may hold that cash in reserve uh, you know it, it just depends on the CDE and, and the strength of the um, of the business uh, but at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the seven years, the, the benefit is a $1.5 million reduction of the cost. Um, so it can be pretty beneficial uh, for the project. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll get clients that will ask me, well, if I'm really only putting in 7.9, you know, what about my depreciation? Well, yeah, you put 7.9 of cash, but because that loan, you have that $2 million loan, that's still your cash. So you are going to get the full depreciation, um, $10 million depreciation, the full depreciation on $10 million. Um, the other question we get is, well, you're talking about an investor. Are they invest, do they have ownership in our project? And no, they don't have ownership. Their, their investment is coming in um, uh, above the, the CDE, right? They're, they're investing in the CDE who is turning around and then giving you that cash. And so you don't have anybody investing actual cash into your project. They're giving you loans. Um, trying to think if there's any other major questions uh, that we get. But, you know, again, you can see it is a, a good in, um, uh, impact on the project. Um, you don't see Iowa on this list as a targeted state. Uh, that's because you've got a number of CDEs that have invested a lot of uh, new market tax credit allocation over the years in Iowa. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that they do look at, um, so they, they have 10 targeted states um, 
each year that CDFI fund um, lists with the application along with the territories. But also what they do is they list um, targeted areas, which is um, Indian country and rural areas, rural counties. And so because a lot of Iowa is um, rural, you also, you know, one would extrapolate out of there that Iowa is also a targeted um, state. Uh, so I, I tell clients a lot, they'll say, well, you know, you're telling me that these are the targeted states, so they're not going to look at the project, you know, in the, in the state that I'm located in. And, you know, I, but, you know, but we are rural. Well, okay, yeah, you're rural. So even though you're not listed as a targeted state, you know, you, you're at a targeted area because um, there's a lot of allocation that has not gone into um, our rural areas and, and our rural states. And so they would have to list every state if they were to list um, rural uh, as the target. So they just put that rural areas. Um, so how, how does the CDE go about identifying, right? Um, you know, they, they have to go and they, they have a pipeline. Uh, so every time they go and they're putting in their application with CDFI fund, they may be requesting, um, you know, a $60 million or $50 million allocation but typically they're providing to CDFI fund 100 to $150 million of projects uh, because they know projects fall apart. They know that um, when by the time they CDFI fund gets around to reviewing the applications and, and giving the allocation, some of the projects that they've had have either, are either completed or they've fallen apart. And so they've got to have that pipeline ready. Um, so they get that pipeline from um, the economic development organizations. They get that pipeline from consultants. They get the pipeline from attorneys uh, that are in the industry. Um, they get that pipeline from actually, you know, feet on the ground, uh, going out and, and actually searching for projects on their own, doing research on their own. Um, they get the pipeline from actually uh, joining different organizations. Uh, and then they go through and they, you know, as, as projects start to apply, they have an intense screening um, uh, for their qualifications. Some CDEs screen for um, different, uh, different things. A lot of them will screen for a number of the same uh, criteria, but then they each have their own mission. And so you have to make sure that you're meeting their mission. Um, and then they, once they come up with their pipeline, uh, they, they have their pipeline that are quote unquote shovel ready. Um, and those are deals that are ready to go, can, that as soon as they find out that they've received allocation, they can start the closing process. Um, and, and then they've got projects that, you know, they, it may not be shovel ready, but it's a project that highly, highly meets their, um, their mission. And it's a project that they, that, you know, has such great community impacts that they're willing to hold some of that allocation for that project. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a little give and take as to uh, when they get the, the allocation out um, and, and what they hold the allocation for in their pipeline. Uh, the underwriting process, you do go through an underwriting process. It, it, they are loans that you're getting, um, albeit interest only loans that at the end of the day, um, you, you purchase your loan at, uh, they're quote unquote forgiven. Uh, you purchase through a put option um, on pennies on the dollar, but there is an underwriting process because it is true debt. You will have debt on your books. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things that they do is they go through their due diligence, right? Um, the underwriting process is not as strict as it is with um, uh, conventional loans. But um, because the investors in the credits are banks, and it's mostly uh, the large banks um, in the country, uh, they will put you through an underwriting process because there is going to have to be a true debt um, analysis done. The IRS will look at that to make sure that the credits are, um, uh, are valid. Um, so they'll go through that capital review. Um, then you know the next step is there's a term sheet re reservation letter. Uh, there's um, financial models that are run. 
um, the CDE will go out, they'll do a site visit, they'll want to hear from, from the business, you know, what are you going to be doing? Let's walk the, uh, let's walk the project. Let's see, you know, where you're going to put, lay that fiber, right? Um, I, the project I did in New Mexico, they actually drove the hundreds of miles uh, that they were going to lay that fiber because they wanted to see the impact. They wanted to see um, where, you know, where that was going, what rural com communities it was going to be impacting. Um, they were able to drive through Indian country. They were able to drive past the schools and the businesses and everywhere through um, uh, Western New Mexico to see, okay, here are the areas that are going to be impacted. Um, you know, and then they go through, they have a board approval of process. And all of this happens over a 60 to 90 day period um, through that closing process. So when, when we say we're going through a new market tax credit closing, that's the whole underwriting process. That's the whole process that we go through um, in order to get to the, the funding of that, um, of the credits or of the funding. Um, you know, the, the critical factors, right? They're, they're gonna look at the financial profile of the business. Um, they're gonna make sure that, the, that it's new market tax credit qualified. You know, what is that, right? There's a but for rationale, very similar to um, negotiated incentives that you would get from um, a city or a county or the state um, economic development. Um, they're gonna make sure that you meet all of the qualified active low-income community business um, tests. Uh, they're, they're going to make sure that um, you're in the greater areas of distress. Yes, can you be in just a distressed area? Yes, those areas qualify. But because the project is, um, or because the program is so competitive, they are looking for the CDEs to be placing the allocation in the, more, in the most severely distressed census tracts, or either and or the rural census tracts. Um, they're going to look at the direct and indirect impacts. Um, they're going to look at employment. They're going to look at services being brought in. Um, they're going to look at the comparison. Is it a for-profit or a non-profit? Um, and if it's a for-profit, they're, they're really going to look at, you know, did you give just enough to get this deal done? Or was, you know, was there a windfall for the company? Um, they're going to look at reputation risk. Uh, they're going to look at how long it's going to take to get the project done. Uh, you have 12 months to deploy the, the, the cash that you get um, from the day to closing. And so they're going to make sure that you're able to get that deal done in 12 months, that you're able to spend those funds in 12 months. So, you know, if you have a, a, a $20 million um, project, but that $20 million project is going to take 24 months to get done, the CDE might say, well, you know what, we'll give you $10 million in the first closing. And then if we get allocation in, um, uh, in the next round, maybe we'll give you another 10 in the next round. Um, and, and they'll give it to you in two different tranches uh, because you know, you, you've got to meet that 12 month period. Uh, and then again, they're looking at key industries and key geographies. You know, I can tell you in the, the past administration, um, a lot of what I saw were, you know, that administration was very, very focused on healthy living, right? So a lot of the projects we saw were around healthcare um, and um, at grocery, healthy foods. And so, you know, if your project impacted, you know, the healthy foods or healthcare, those were a lot of the projects that I saw. Um, this administration, a lot of the projects um, that I'm seeing are CDEs looking for, you know, some of the more rural areas. They're looking for projects that are, um, uh, that are more based around manufacturing. Um, those are more of the projects that, you know, as we talk to the different CDEs that they're looking for. Um, and then we look at the investors, right? And, and, and what the investors are looking for and how many, you know, some of them will say, you know what, yeah, you've got this hotel project. We've got too many hotels in our portfolio. We're not looking for that. Or even the CDEs will tell us, yeah, we're not looking for a hotel or we're not looking for um, any grocery or we're not looking for, you know, projects in, um, in, you know, this state because we've got too many in this state, but I need them in this other state. Uh, you know, so they, they, they really go through this whole analysis 
um, and that's one of the things that we stay on top of um, as consultants to make sure that um, that that we're uh, staying on top of what the um, what they're looking for. Um, Jonathan will tell you uh, we we reach out to them for every conference to to meet with um, either him or his team uh, to see okay you know here are the projects we have but also tell us what are you looking for um, is there a specific state is there a specific um, uh, type of project that you're looking for help us help you find the type of project that you need uh, to close on your allocation. Um, so just a couple of case studies just to show you um, the the different types of projects we've done. Um, you know, here's a manufacturing project that we did. Uh, it wasn't a big job creator, but it did retain um, a lot of jobs. This one was there was a possibility that the um, the plant could be closed and taken offshore. Um, it had been acquired by a foreign parent, and so you know we what we were trying to do was to keep the plant actually um, in the U.S. Um, and specifically in Texas. Uh, the project was a thirty-two million dollar project. What we got was eight million dollars in allocation. Um, so you don't necessarily get the amount of allocation as the amount of what your project is. The next one is more, the one that you guys would be really interested in. So this is the project I was talking about in rural New Mexico. So um, we've done two closings um, for this one. The first one was a $10 million um, allocation. And then the second one was a $5.5 .5 million allocation. And um, the, the first one was really the larger uh, one because that was where uh, they were starting to get that they they had just started their broadband project uh, and then the second um, round of allocation was just the piece that qualified because they had parts of the project that were going through various census tracts that didn't qualify so we only had 5.5 .5 million that um, that qualified uh, but what it allowed us to do was in getting that allocation it allowed us to um, put the allocation towards um, uh, towards that small piece of that second phase of the project because then at that point, without getting that piece of the project done, they weren't going to be able to get to the other qualified areas that they needed to. Um, and so we actually got really, really creative um, with this and we were able to uh, it's also they're also a, a utility company um, for electric and so we were able to recapture some of the electric um, wholesale purchases that they use um, in order for us to uh, to recapture some of those costs in order for us to do just the minimal size broadband that was qualified um, because once we knew that once we got that piece of the um, broadband done everything in the third phase was going to qualify um, and so in, in this um, uh, utility, they are very open to changing their, um, where they're rolling out their broadband um, in order to get the allocation. And so, it, you know, while they were going further west, they've actually started to look and say, you know, if we need to go southwest in order to get the allocation, we'll do that um, in order to start meeting those needs. Um, in, that, in those underserved uh, areas. And so they're starting to look at going on to some of the Indian reservations and having those conversations um, with the reservations on how they can get that to work um, with the use of new market tax credits. And then um, this is one in, in Lincoln uh, where we had a sports facility uh, that was, um, uh, that was being done that received a $10 million allocation. And that was just first the first phase of the sports facility um, that received, and, and this project just received state new market tax credit allocation instead of federal. So does anybody have any questions for Miriam? I think we'll take a couple minutes and then we'll transition over to Jonathan and then open for, for more questions. To uh, throw up a question, I believe there's a way you can do a Q&A or what's the other way? Um, that's the primary way. Uh, there's the Q&A button on the bottom. Uh, 
you click that, type your question in, and, and I will see it, and uh, we'll share it with everybody. Um, the function, we don't have a raise your hand function uh, because it's a webinar, but uh, so that's your primary way to ask questions. And uh, if you have any right now, um, you can type them in. And then of course, I'll be watching those as we, we continue. So in the interest of time though, we might wanna go ahead and move on to Jonathan's piece. So, so now I'd like to introduce uh, both Jonathan and also Dan, I'm going to apologize. I, I can't pronounce your name. I don't have, it's, it's Dan Helgeson, both with the um, Rural Development Partners and Forest City. I believe they're both in the Forest City office. Um, and so they will talk a little bit about um, what their side of this equation, which is the community development entity side. And this will be very interesting. I've not understood this from our local provider here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this. Thanks, Jonathan. You do need to unmute. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Jonathan Clausen. Uh, Rural Development Partners uh, has been uh, a community development entity, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so nearly since the beginning of the, of the New Market Tax Credit Program in the early 2000s, we first started deploying to projects in uh, 2005. I've uh, come, come from a banking background, business banking, senior loan officer for a community bank uh, located in North Iowa. Um, but I've been with Rural Development Partners now for a little over two years. Uh, so um, we've, got a, we've got a pretty good history to, to build upon and I'll, I can share a little bit more. Um, Miriam did a really great job of just giving a broad overview of new markets and, and from her position, she really has to think about what do all CDEs look for and how do I put together and find the right uh, allocation partners. Um, and so I'm just going to be able to give you the perspective of, of a particular CDE um, that we work with. All the things that she talked about, we have to be competent in as well. And we're just a, 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 a particular example of it. So um, yeah, Curtis, thank you. So I'll just, since this slide is up, I'll just, uh, I do have another slide that talks about being a community development entity, but as uh, Miriam stated, uh, that's kind of the ticket you need to be able to apply annually for new market tax credits. And, you know, Miriam's right that anybody can be a CDE, but, but it is very difficult to, um, to have that track record. And, and especially at this point in the program, after it's been around for, you know, 15 plus years, it's matured to the point that uh, it's very competitive with the existing uh, group that has a lot of, of, of experience and so forth. So, um, that, that, but that is the, and I, again, I have another slide that kind of shows how that's all connected to the government. So you can go to the next slide, Curtis. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see on the right there, but this is just a, a picture of one of our projects, but, but um, this, this one happens to be in, in Mississippi. But um, just, just to give you a little bit about um, uh, Rural Development Partners um, uh, mission um, and what and what we do. We are a national CDE. We focus on rural projects. Um, so uh, not all CDEs are national. Some are actually city-based, some are state-based, some are regional-based um, because we, uh, you know, as Miriam stated, you know, job creation is one of the big community uh, outcomes uh, for, for the program and that we are a pretty traditional in that sense is that's what we focused on is is uh, bringing economic development to rural America by um, first and foremost uh, a lot of job creation, uh, but uh, also um, definitely the the we we every every CD has kind of their unique way of of bringing value to the table there. So just to give you a, a, a little bit idea of terms, there's there's a there's an application cycle. So there's also timing that goes with, with getting new market tax credits to go with your, with your project. Um, there's, uh, we, new, Rural Development Partners has, has had eight awards over the years, a uh, total of $540 million of, of, of tax credits. At this point, um, we don't have any further tax credits to deploy. Um, all our industry awaits uh, excitedly for <laughs> probably about mid-July to find out who's getting um, the, next, the next allocation. About usually around 250 CDEs apply for it and somewhere in the 70s uh, get, get an, an award. 
Um, and also for rural areas, 20% uh, of the program for, the, for quite a few years now has been dedicated to, to rural. So when we apply, we have to say how much we're gonna do in rural versus non, I mean, it's called Metro and non-Metro. Um, rural Development Partners has done most everything in non-Metro or rural areas. We do uh, also uh, request a bit of uh, Metro allocation because uh, the way that um, the country is labeled Metro and non-Metro is not always as quite as intuitive as you think. It's actually a very complex determination and sometimes there are projects that have very real rural impacts that, that technically are in a uh, a metro census tract. So to have that flexibility, we do get that. But 20% of the program would be, uh, at this point, $700 million nationwide that can go to rural areas, or that's how much targeted for those rural areas. And then the other thing that Miriam brought up was, was target states or, or under, uh, underserved states. Generally, uh, about 40 to 50% of our projects need to go to underserved states. So Iowa, again, isn't one of them, but of course the uh, Iowa rural projects would still be things that, that rural development partners can do. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide, I just wanted to, to kind of bring out, um, we do work with both businesses and nonprofits. One of, one of the main things that we try to do when we pick a project is something that has catalytic impact. And just to let you know, you know, I, th I think it's been shared that broadband is somewhat of an emerging new area within new market tax credits. There hasn't been a lot done on it yet. Um, you know, Miriam and her group are, are really a, a forerunner in being able to have some successful broadband projects. It's really, um, uh, right up Rural Development Partners Alley in the sense of meeting our mission of bringing economic impact uh, to, to rural areas and, and jobs. It doesn't bring jobs directly. Um, and as Miriam talked about, the process is so competitive for CDEs, we really have to do what we say we're going to do on our application. But there is also a mechanism for how the program evolves. And, and over time, you know, we can get into new things. And this is certainly something we have, have our eye on. But for example, and, and Mary mentioned healthy food financing, we have chosen to go that direction as, as a supplement to what we do, thinking that um, uh, our, our organization has a lot of agricultural background and history. A lot of projects we did earlier on were, were food manufacturing based and even some ethanol project type related things. Now it's more food manufacturing or actual or, or non-food manufacturing. But, you know, food, we're just always very tied to food here in Iowa. And so we really uh, have done projects for food banks that help bring food infrastructure to food security issues in rural areas. And a lot of times those are located in metro areas, but they have a big impact in, in the rural areas as well. So that, that's an example of how our program uh, at RDP has been very job creation focused, but we've evolved to be able to do a little, a portion of, of, our, of our allocation towards food banks. Um, and you know, it's potential if the program evolves and creates a community outcome specifically for broadband or there's um, an infrastructure bill that has some additional allocation for broadband. There's a lot of different ways that I think this is on people's radar that it's super important. And this is a program that's so established uh, and so able to deploy capital um, that, that it just makes sense that how could we tie this more and more to new markets. But the catalytic impact is big because of course broadband is a real catalytic impactor and allows for businesses to be more effective, people to work from home, people to uh, live in a smaller rural community, but maybe their, their job is in a larger, you know, work remotely and those types of things. But specifically, we choose projects uh, that are going to attract a lot more um, uh, private capital to that community is something we really look for in our selection process. For an example, uh, if there's a new industrial park and utilities need to be brought out to that park and that gets done because of this project. And then now that, now we can look during the seven years that we're helping um, manage that project, uh, several other businesses move into that business park. That is uh, really one of the things we, we, we try to go for and talk about in our applications. Hey, because, because this, of this project, look at all the other things that are happening in this community and all the other uh, private capital that's going in. So that's a huge part of it and of course, 
I think broadband uh, speaks to the catalytic piece. Next slide. This just shows you, you know, just a little, a small graphic, but the United States Treasury Department is what uh, overall uh, governs the world, I mean, governs the, the new market tax credit uh, industry. And the CDFI fund is within the, the US Treasury Department. When we apply annually for new market tax credits, uh, it is to the, the CDFI fund. And that is on an annual basis. There, of course, have been interruptions in the past somewhat for you know a government shutdown. There's been a year where there had to be a double round a few years ago because something happens. But 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 really, it's been it, it's been a program that's been funded consistently over that you know 16 plus year time period, um, not without a couple of hiccups along the way. But it really has been a successful program um, to get to get uh, to. And what we use it to, of course, is to attract businesses to move to or relocate or or expand in rural areas when maybe it would make more sense for them in some ways. Uh, or be easier for them to go to a more populated area. Um, we, we, we help them get to rural areas. And then of course, the other thing that we really focus on um, is workforce development because we feel that we see that as a consistent need that uh, not only do rural areas need the jobs, but then they need to help uh, with, the, you know, with the population of employees uh, that they have to help them fit with the jobs well. So. It's a, it's a real fit process too. If these pro projects are going to be successful, um, if they're going to uh, reflect well, uh, if they're gonna be, you know, help your community and, and, and be according to our mission. Next slide. Um, talked about this uh, a catalytic piece, but this is just a slide to focus on what we've done traditionally because they're what, what we viewed as is the most catalytic projects in terms of both supply chain and then just adding economic uh, potential to a community would be manufacturing and distribution and food processing kind of being like manufacturing in that sense. But um, through that supply chain, whether it's transportation, you know, or, or you know, distribution, if it's manufacturing, um, if, you, if you invest in manufacturing, that generally, uh, you know, is a place where you, you create growth there. It creates growth on both sides of it. Um, and similarly, distribution has, has you know, is, is, is connected to a supply chain. But in addition to the supply chain, we always also look about what, what's going on with that community. This particular project is going to be a, a big starter for them and, and helping them grow beyond just this project. So, um, you know, for, our, for the New Market Tax Credit Program, we have to focus on quality jobs. So the jobs have to be, well, you know, good paying jobs. They have to have benefits, um, you know, training. Um, all kinds of things like that. Uh, you know, what do the what do the employers do to work with populations that you know maybe have traditionally been left out? Um, whether it's uh, you know whether it's um, you, know, you know racial disparities or whether it's uh, people that are transitioning from from different you know from prison situations or if even if it's just people that have uh, not had the education in the past, you know, so those are types of things that are workforce development grants as well that we try to make uh, fit. Just a, an example of a Midwest project. Uh, uh, this was uh, this was done in, in Litchfield, Nebraska. You've seen you've seen a couple of uh, of uh, Miriam's projects as well. But in this one, there wasn't so much of a workforce development opportunity. But we were able to partner with uh, with the project and the school to use some of the grant that we use from some of our profits for the project to to do a greenhouse, and they supply food to the school. And uh, they give a, a, an opportunity for the kids to, to work in it and take a lot of pride in that. Um, and it, so it becomes actually, it's a very practical thing in terms of the food that it's outputting um, and, and, and the, the kids are involved in doing it. And so um, that's just an example of how we try to do a lot more than just bring a job to a community. Next. This just shows a map. Um, you know, we've been going for, like I said, 15 plus years with placing projects, but because that $540 million, our average project maybe is in the $15 million range, we kind of do bigger chunks in general than some CDEs because the rural CDEs traditionally have gotten bigger allocations. But um, you see uh, the green areas are where we've done projects. That's 22 states. Um, the Hawaii project was before I got here, unfortunately, but we're looking for a January Hawaii project this year. Uh, <laughs> but, but so no state 
on this map has more than three projects that we've done in it. So um, we, we, that's not necessarily been by design. That's just kind of the nice dispersion of it. You see a big southeast uh, component there because that is where a lot of manufacturing um, revitalization of those communities that have seen some of their traditional uh, higher, you know, whether it's the textile industries and, and, and some of the, uh, the coal mining and those types of things, some of those big industries that exited over the last 10, 20, 30 years um, have uh, left buildings that have been able to be repurposed and, and had uh, manufacturing come in. And we've seen some reshoring of some industries, which has been exciting as well. So that's just a quick overview uh, uh, on rural development partners. And, you know, the main thing I think is just uh, we are an Iowa based uh, CDE, but we do, we work nationally. Um, just want you to be able to have us as a contact person. We, we can speak to the things uh, Miriam did in terms of, of helping you understand parts of the program and, and, and she's a resource as well on it too. But I think uh, nice to just have somebody local to speak uh, with about that as well. So appreciate being uh, uh, asked to be part of it. Dan, did you have anything to add? No, I think uh, kind of with the timing here, we'll just save it for any questions anyone's got. Okay, great. So with that, does anybody have any questions for either Jonathan or Miriam or Dan? The, um, I, we don't have any questions that have come in online. Um, I have just a real quick one. Um, if, uh, and this Miriam, Jonathan, either one of you can answer this, um, what would be kind of an expected timeline from when a entity would begin the, the the first idea of hey let's try to use new market tax credits for this project to when that money is actually available is this a year-long process two-year-long process what are we looking at there you know and, and shauna's heard me say this i i tell my clients all the time i could listen to what the project is i could say you know what i have a cd that might be interested pick up the phone and you know, in a couple of days have somebody interested, um, or it could be never. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it truly is, it's one of those where, you know, the, as early as possible to be thinking about it, but it, it's something where they also have to be also looking at other options. Right. Um, not something where they can say, oh, well, you know, we're hanging our hat on this 100%. Um, you know, if that is, if, if this is the last option, right, that they have for, for being able to raise the funds, that's something we need to know because that mm -hmm. does go for the but for it. If this is the very last thing for, you know, hey, but for this, this project is definitely going to tank. Um, that does help us with our but for. But um, yeah, it, it really just depends on where we are in the funding cycle. You know, like Jonathan said, we're waiting, you know, it was supposed to be May, then it was supposed to be June. We're now, I think, going into July as to when we're going to get notification of, um, of the, this next round that's going to be announced. Um, we're, you know, once that happens, you know, CDEs are going to be looking for shovel ready projects. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a shovel ready project, they may get pushed and, and they have their leveraged in place, meaning that, you know, if the benefit is going to bring in $2 million. They've got that other $8 million in place. If they have that, that kind of gives them, puts them in better standing than a project that, yeah, maybe the impacts are better, but they don't have that leverage in place. They don't have the rest of the money in place for the project. Yeah. May, you know, put them a little bit higher, but then there's the CDEs. It's still, are this is, are the CDEs willing to wait for them to get that leverage? Um, so it, it, it's really, really hard to say unless it's a project that the CDE has put into their application. You know, they already know that it's a project they want to do. They're just waiting to find out if they've received allocation or not. So is that is that kind of the the Jonathan from your standpoint? Is that normally what happens when you when you request an allocation? You already have a bunch of projects lined up to that would use that. Or do you have some that are lined up and others kind of like, you know, floater money that you can use for projects that you haven't identified when you put your application in? Yeah, great question. So the application that we're waiting for to find out on the award right now, um, that, was, that was submitted at the end of October last year. Okay. At that 
point in our application, we had to put in all our projects that we were going to do. Now they understand, we call that a representative pipeline. So we need to do projects like that if we don't do those projects. Sure. And of course, because of the timing and everything, it's not likely that we end up doing most of those projects. But right. so what we're doing continually is updating that timeline as, the, as, the, as it comes around. And now that we're getting ready to hit this next month, we have projects that we are ready to to go on uh, as soon as we can. And, and, and as Miriam said, shovel ready, which is a little bit loosely used in our, <laughs> 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 but uh, you're at real shovel ready is having that leverage in place and ready to go. And, and it's just the reality of, of the cycle is that um, we have to deploy that allocation as quickly as we can for the highest impact projects we can or else we won't be able to apply next year. Um, and so that's kind of the cycle we're on. So sometimes that can get missed and, and, and just on the timing, everything has to work out kind of perfectly. <laughs> so it sounds like um, if, if any, uh, any, anyone on this call, attendees were thinking about how to utilize new market tax credits for a community broadband project, they should probably be doing a lot of the other steps that to establish whether that's a viable project or not before they start thinking about new market tax credits or any other form of financing, right? They'll yeah, get the card in front of the horse, in other words. Or, or it should be simultaneous. Okay. You, you know, so um, kind of when we were talking to Kevin, right? It, it was, as Kevin it was working through his, his process of, um, uh, of, looking at the project to see if it was feasible, they were also getting up to speed on what is new markets, can, can it work, right. and where do we plug it in into the process, mm -hmm. and okay, let's run our numbers. If we get new markets, here's what we need. If we don't get new markets, here's what we need. Um, with you're going after, if we don't get new markets, here's the funding we need to raise. Here, here's yep. what we need, or here's, here's the timing of when we can get everything done. Um, and then, you know, if you get new markets, hey, great. Now you can, you can get the project done, but always look as if you're not going to get it. Right. They, you, you don't, that's putting the cart before the horse. If you, if you say, oh, I'm going to, you know, do everything as if I'm going to get new markets, unless you've already got a, a, a solid commitment. There are some CDs that will say, if I get allocation, yes, this is a project that has enough impacts. It's, it meets our mission enough that, if we get allocation, we will give it to this project. And then you know, okay, it's just then dependent upon them getting the allocation. And not, it's dependent upon them getting the allocation and still liking my project. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, and I can kind of wrap this back up with particular to our project. Um, where we stand is our total project to finish out the Insider Red Oak is about 10.5 million, of which we would need 4 million up front in cash to get it started. And so with new market tax credit, you know, that actually we're thinking is about half or about 6 million potentially with that 2 million upfront cash. So I'm looking for another two to three, maybe 4 million um, to really get the project going. And so with all the funds that are com coming down now, from the federal government, USDA, and the states, what we're trying to figure out is what can we plug in where to meet that gap so that we could get this on the target um, or down the pipeline, on a pipeline to talk with the CD here about how viable our project is. So again, it's, I've got to figure out what are, what are the other funding sources available? What are the timing of all of those? Um, what's going to be required through their rules and regulations for each of those because they haven't been defined yet um, and how viable are all of those? So, um, you know, we're, we're still looking down the road, but um, we're doing all kinds of things that are getting very creative, and that's what we have to do to, to fund these programs and these projects. So as you hear this large amount coming down, it's still very expensive for communities to do this, and it really does. We, we need to look at FCC definition of, of yeah. served and underserved, population size of what's considered rural, and then looking at comparing the Apple, the access to broadband and the bandwidth capacity to handle the amount of people that are going to be on line consecutively at the same time with the demands that COVID has now brought forward. And, 
And as education decides whether or not they're gonna go back to school full time or do more online learning, as hospitals are do more, doing more and more telemed, um, and, um, and we're seeing more and more communities take part in telemed, the demand for capacity bandwidth is just as important as the whole um, access. So uh, it's a double-sided coin, it's challenging, but you know, be prepared, having your um, models. Working with C-band is great first step because it gives you the, the background to get your research, the background, Around to uh, get your drawings and your and your build out and your budget and everything in line and be ready for understanding what, what your financial needs are. And then we're, we really appreciate um, Jonathan and Miriam for being on with us today. And I'm going to turn the, the close up to you, um, Curtis. Thank um, you. But thank you everybody for being on here and, and we hope that everyone learned something. Yeah, I very much appreciate everybody's time. This is a fascinating topic and hopefully useful for everybody that's been on. Just want to remind everybody that a recording of today's webinar will be available uh, on the C-Ban YouTube page, uh, and it'll also be posted at our broadbandaction.com website. So you'll be able to access that. I know a couple people had to dump off early, so they'll be able to go back and see that last few minutes that they missed. Um, and uh, keep watching on uh, our CBAN website and social media for Community Broadband Action Network as we'll be letting you know when our next CBAN Lunch and Learn will be and what the topic will be. So on behalf of everybody here on uh, the Lunch and Learn, thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.